Ladies and gentlemen, sports fans alike, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. One of the couple, two, three best podcasts around. So sit back, grab yourself a cold one and a pull of sausage, park your keister in the front room, and listen to Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. In Chicago, you know that all sports rock. The Bears, Hawks, Bulls, Cubs, and Sox. Pick your favorite, you can choose as long as the Packers lose. For everything you need to know, it's Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. This is your hosts, Alex and Sean. On this episode, we are going to be very, very not happy with the miserable performance we saw today. Uh, we'll probably have some little baseball talk here and there, but before we jump into that, I want to thank our sponsor, the Rockford Ice Hogs. If you're not familiar with the Rockford Ice Hogs, they're the AHL minor league affiliate of the Chicago Blackhawks. What does that mean for you? You get to see the stars of tomorrow today at family-friendly, affordable prices. Sure, the season is not going on right now, thanks to COVID, but that shouldn't stop you from heading on over to icehogs.com, getting yourself a hat, shirt, jersey, season tickets, and more. Tell them Swirsky Sports sent you. What an absolute dog turd game we saw today. Sean, I think we have to establish something right off the bat here. We, we, we just got to say it right now. That Don't look at the score. That game was not a close game. There is no glory or no sign of hope with garbage time points. There just isn't. No, there, there's not. It was, they made the score much closer than it was. Uh, and this is, and the thing is, um, you know, this defensively, they did, the Bears did plenty enough to keep you in this ball game. Yeah, I actually thought the defense played better than I expected them to. It's just after a while, the offense, well, the offense, you know, gave up a, a fumble return for a touchdown, which just was an absolute dagger. But it was at the at a certain point, you know, the, the Titans just, you know, they just were able to pound the ball and take all the risks they could because they knew the Bears couldn't do anything offensively. Right, and as we've said in many years past, when your offense can't do anything and your defense is out there for a long time, eventually they're going to get tired. I mean, look, they gave up 17 points today. Now, the first touchdown they gave up, to, you know, I, I watched it and I'm like, you know, the coverage was pretty good. He just, he just made a nice grab. Like that, you just, that was one of those, he just, made the play I mean you saw the game they were able to shut down the run game pretty well today I'd say and they got a lot of pressure on Ryan Tannehill they did what they needed to do to keep them in that game and in response we have uh, fourth and one situations that should not happen because all you had to do was just scamper another yard and then you were going to run a play that the the Second, it was snapped. You knew they weren't going to convert that first down, and you know, you know what I'm talking about on the first drive. Oh, oh yeah. The it, minute that play was snapped, the second it was snapped, you knew that they were just going to go backwards. Yeah. So I mean, let's let's just start with the elephant in the room. This was a dog shit offensive line prior to the injuries. Yeah, it was never good. And you, I mean, I'm just going to sum this up. So. From, from opening week, what you expected your starters to be, you still have your left tackle in place, Charles Leno. At left guard, um, you, you now are... So you went from James Daniels, who got hurt, to Alex Bars in that game, who then was benched for Rashad Cow, or, you know, well, he... Alex Bars went into that, next, that game during the injury, and then the next week... Uh, Rashad Coward got the start. Um, and then now it is Arlington Hambright. 
And at center, you had Cody Whitehair. He got injured. And then you went with Sam Mustafar, who was a rookie, undrafted rookie last year. He got injured. So you've moved Alex Bars to play uh, to play center. Um, and then you have Jermaine Effetti at right guard. You had... Um, uh, you moved Rashad Coward over to right tackle because Bobby Massey got hurt. And then his replacement, Jason Spriggs, got was he hurt or got COVID. Whatever, he's out. So now you are at Rashad Coward, Jermaine Affetti, Alex Bars, Arlington Hambright, Charles Leno. That is a absolute dog crap offensive line. And Hambright was one of their last draft picks, I believe, from this past year. I believe he was the seventh round pick. Yeah. Um, and so that is um, that is not the offensive line that you you really want to go with. Um, so and, and you what you saw was exactly what you thought you were going to see. Is there was there was absolutely no no ability to open a hole for a running back and the nope. the pocket absolutely just decimated and got collapsed onto a quarterback that is probably one of the most statuesque quarterbacks in the league and he was a panicky Pete all day oh yeah i mean he was constantly constantly under pressure and he just kind of didn't know what to do at that point, Nick Foles really did not know what to do at that point. And you couldn't establish a run because you're not going anywhere on the run. And then when it looks like you do have a glimpse of something, you know, you're committing penalties. You know what really stood out to me today was before the end of the first half. When you uh, forced a punt, it was a really nice punt from the end zone but you were able to at least bring it to around midfield. So you say, you know what, a throw or two, and you can at least get a field goal here and make it a 10 to three game. You're right back in it then. And then you two penalties hands in the face and what an offsides or uh, something like that. False start. I believe. Yeah. False start. It was a false start and a hands in the face. I mean, it, you're taking every opportunity you can to shoot yourself in the foot. You already had so so much difficulty getting first downs and uh and you set yourself up with penalties, a false start and a hands to the face and and you are just absolutely there's no way you're going to get it barring a penalty, barring a, a you know, a, a automatic first down penalty like a pass interference to bail you out. Like that's that you're just you're only able to get it, it, you know, luck. Um, so it, it's it's just dog shit. And I'm looking at the offensive line here. Rashad Coward was an undrafted defensive tackle that was converted to an offensive lineman. Mm -hmm. Jermaine Effetti was actually a first round draft pick, but he was cast off by the Seahawks because he what he wasn't up to their expectation. Uh, Alex Bars was an undrafted rookie, mostly due to injury, but. You know, he's he wouldn't have been a super high draft pick anyway. Arlington Hambright was a seventh round pick. Charles Leno, I believe, was a sixth or seventh round pick. So you have a scab offensive line put together. And um I, like I, I what what did you think was gonna happen? You have terrible depth, you and you got bad luck of injuries, and it, it just exposes how bad your offensive line was. And this is just, it, it's, it's an indictment on the general manager and it's an indictment on the head coach whose inability to, to scheme around them. Yeah. What I really just want at this point I, I, you know, I'll be honest. I'm at a point where I'm like, you know what? I don't have any hope for 
a playoff run whatsoever. I mean, you're five and four. You're going to play the Vikings next week, and the Vikings are on a two win streak. You know, I think you could beat them, but then you got to go to Green Bay. And then, you know, you play the Lions. I mean, your schedule is not totally unfavorable. I mean, you play the Jaguars, you play the Texans, you play the Lions, but, you know, you got two games coming up against Green Bay. And I think we're at a point where we've accepted we're not winning the division. If we are going to get in the playoffs, it's going to be a wild card. You are not winning the NFC North. I I just don't see this team being able to carry itself for, for, you know further down the road. I, I just don't understand is is what do you think what does what does Hallis Hall think is going to happen magically with this offensive line and this offense in general? is this defensively, we have a good enough defense where we could go undefeated if we could put together any semblance of offense. Uh, The Vikings, the Vikings are an absolutely beatable team. The problem is with this offensive line and with Matt Nagy just crumbling as far as an offensive play caller, I mean, absolutely crumbling. He is a bumbling idiot. He might be a, a really good head coach where, you know, he's got his players ready to play, but still that's up in the air because there's, they're not all ready to play. Um, and, but as a play caller, he, there's no arguing. He's dog crap. Like this, this is bad. Uh, I mean, you know, we talked about, uh, we talked about going forward on fourth down. So, you know, right away you had Allen Robinson where he this was a boneheaded Allen Robinson play right at the beginning. You talked about it briefly, but on third down and in a decent chunk, he could have taken one step forward and gotten that first down. Yeah. Oh, that's all you needed. That's all you needed. It was one little step. And he, and honestly, I think if he, the way he extended his arm, he probably got it. Matt Nagy should have thrown the challenge flag on that. I would have thrown the challenge flag way before I decided to go for it on fourth down. And and then what the hell was that fourth down run? Oh, is, just... is Here's the thing. On a fourth down run, you need to either hit the hole early or hit it hard or both. And that was a slow developing run where the, the running back had to slightly change direction because it was a misdirection and he was flat footed. So if there's no hole there to back cut to, he's dead to rights. He doesn't have a full head of steam to, to hit the pile and drive it. It's it's, it was a slight misdirection. And if you don't have that lane, it's, it's a dead to rights play. At least if you have it with running back where he hits the, the, you know, hits it with a running start, or you have an up back um, that you do an early handoff to. So a lot of times you'll see on fourth and goal, or I mean, fourth down or goal, you know, fourth and short or goal line, you'll have an up back, like a full back, half back, you know, up. And the quarterback drops back like he's going to hand to the running back and does a quick handoff to the up back. And he's able to hit that hole sooner you know, before any defensive players are able to blow the play up. And and those are the types of things. Is Matt Nagy has these slow developing run plays. And ever when you know a run play is gonna happen and you call a slow developing play like that with a bad offensive line, it's just never gonna work. It's it's absolutely never going to work unless you have a defensive play player make a boneheaded play like you know, grabbing a face mask or missing a wide open tackle. It's just not going to work. And I don't understand what in the world Matt Nagy is thinking by thinking that's going to work and thinking that's a good call. I mean, like I said, you're watching it the very second the ball is snapped, you know that's going to blow up in your face. I mean, you just knew it. Defenses don't need to be geniuses or be, you know, high alert to read that kind of thing. I mean, it's so obvious. Those slow developing plays, it's 
it's like asking a professor to read C spot run. I mean, it's so easy. It's it's just abysmal, and and this is not a good defense you're playing. Like I I I could see it, you know, when you're playing a very good defense, things just not aren't going well. This is not a good defense. This Tennessee Titans team, they're well coached, but they are not a good defense at all. And and you made them look like, you know, the '85 Bears. They were just in your backfield eating lunch. You know, blowing up your run plays, blowing up your quarterback, creating havoc. That that's exactly what they did. You know, causing fumbles, and it, it was it was bad. This is a team. This this Tennessee team is the worst, far and away team defensively on third downs in the NFL. They're at about they give up first downs around sixty two percent of the time. 62, it's like 61.8 wow. or something. And yeah. the next the next worst team is like 55%. So you're... Huge difference. Huge difference. The Bears didn't have a first... A, they didn't convert a third down in the first half. And they only converted two in the entire game. They were 2 and 15, 13%. Like that's... That's just... That's unbelievably bad. Yeah, and the thing too is n- so many of those play attempts to try to get a first down, they weren't even close. Either you got smothered or the pass was deflected as he was getting hit and it went like three, four yards and you needed like eight or nine or ten yards to get a first down. There wasn't anything even close. It, it just it looked so, so helpless. And there have been games where the Bears struggled to score, but at least they've been able to move the ball a little bit. You weren't even seeing that. And and what's crazy is if you looked at the just the raw numbers, Derrick Henry being held to 3.2 yards a carry and only 68 yards, Ryan Tannehill only passing for 158 yards, and and didn't think that they blew you out of the water? No. No, I mean, you wouldn't think by the numbers, but... In the first half, this is how bad the run game was. In the first half, the leading rusher was Barkevious Mingo. Yeah, on the uh, fake punt, which was the only good play of the game for the Bears. Literally, it was the the only good play. Uh, I mean... I, they had some good defensive plays, but uh, as offensively, offensive or special teams, that was the only good play of this game. It was this 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 team is just abysmal, and I don't know how you get better at this point. You don't. You don't. Like this, these are. We knew they weren't a good team. I mean, we they were they were a very good defensive team. They were able to smoke and mirrors, win some games. But you start going back to look at it, and you're like, "All right, well, at what point did was it smoke? You know, absolute smoke and mirrors, and what parts were good?" Uh, and you're like, "So the Falcons game. So the Fal- I mean, I guess we will start right with the the beginning of the season. They they came back and beat the the Lions, and." The Lions are a bad team. Okay, so maybe that was a bad Lions team. You barely beat the Giants. That's a bad team. You came back and beat the Falcons. And now we're learning that's that's just a team that chokes in the fourth quarter. They, they choked to the Lions for goodness sake. What they, does that tell you? They were up huge against the, uh, the Broncos and almost lost. Mm-hmm. Um, and you you got smoked by the Colts. Smoke and mirrors somehow won against the Buccaneers. Um, you you came back against the Panthers. That was actually a good game. But then you got smoked by the Rams. You looked bad against the Saints. You looked really bad against the Titans. And now you got the Vikings. And how are you gonna how are you gonna piece together this this offense? to get you enough points. Defensively, you should probably shut down the Vikings. Is I think they're going to 
they're going to eat up Dalvin Cook. And, uh, and you know, I, I don't think there's going to be too much of a passing game there. Because the, well, you know, the Bears have you know a how you're good pass them. Defense. You know how you're going to beat them is you're just going to have to get a couple of picks off Kirk Cousins. And that's the thing is, is the defense is going to have to start scoring points if you're going to win. And I, if the offense is that bad versus the, how good the defense is, how is there not some sort of animosity in that locker room? Yeah, that's something you do think about. There's no question about that. I mean, the defense has got to be exhausted by now with how much they're on the field, with how much they have to carry the team. We should, you know, no no fan base should be sitting expecting more from a defense to score for them because their offense can't. What sign does that tell you? Oh, yeah, it tells you that this team isn't very good, even with a good defense. You shouldn't be sitting there saying, hey, we need our defense to score for us. I mean, that really shouldn't be the case ever with any team. Yeah. If, you, if you want to be a true Super Bowl contender. Is, you know, your, your first pick in the draft, Cole Komet, you know how many targets he got today? How many? I don't even know. None. I didn't think he got any. Your quarterback threw f- 52 times, and your your future tight end got zero targets. Darnell Mooney got 11 targets. Allen Robinson got nine. Uh, Anthony Miller got eight. Jimmy Graham got six. Ryan Nall got four. Cordero Patterson got four. David Montgomery got three. Riley Ridley got uh, two. And that was, that was that. Can I, can I ask you something, an opinion of yours that I feel like I've noticed, but I kind of want a second opinion on it. Sure. I want to talk about Cordell Patterson for just a quick second, because you mentioned it, particularly on special teams. Does he look slower to you? Yes. Like significantly slower? He is not getting down there as a gunner. Um, and there has been no explosive. I mean, he is taking everything out of the end zone, and he is he has not had an explosive return yet. No, and I mean, last year we saw a number of those. I mean, he's done that his entire career. He's arguably, you know, the past few years, he has arguably been the best return man in football. And last year, you know, he did get a touchdown. We were calling that game on Hot Mike. And he had a few good returns past the 40-yard line. Whereas this year, I feel like every time he takes it out, he'll just end up at the 20 or the 25, and it'll just be like a touchback at most. Yeah, it, it has not been good. And I don't know why they're still giving him the green light to return him. Is is he's not even getting back to the, the twenty five uh, on a, a good chunk of these, um, you know, and you're just you're just putting guys out there to uh, for you know on a risk and and not for any benefit. Right. I just uh, it, it sucks to see because I really I really like Cordero Patterson and I've always thought he's he's a good type of weapon you can have on an offense, but. I just, this year, you're not seeing as much from him, especially on special teams. I think, I mean, he's still a very fundamentally sound special teams player. There's no question about that. It's just, you know, his number one asset is his speed, and he's able to get those yards, and he's just not getting them this year. I mean, he's hanging out of the ball. He's not fumbling them. Like I said, he's very sound when it comes to his uh, special teams play. It's just you don't see the quickness and explosiveness. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if it's because he's he's getting more offensive plays and he's getting, you know, hit more. And you just, you know, that's taking a toll and he's used to to being much more fresh and just getting tackled on specialty. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. But you're you're right. You're you're right. Um But but looking back at this Bears team is I the last drive of the first half just really summed up what this offense is. Yeah, it and, really did. And 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 what's honestly what's worse than those penalties, so the false start and the illegal hands to the face, is when you started to move the ball and you made a pass and you ran twenty five seconds off the clock 
to get up to the line of scrimmage and run a play. Yep. And yep. Yep. you didn't yep. have any timeouts and you couldn't spike the ball because I think it was third down. Mm-hmm. And you ran 25 seconds off because you are so, it's so, Matt Nagy cannot get a goddamn play into, into the thing that's, you know, just have a basic offense where you can run a play in. Not everything has to be a stupid, ex- complicated system to get in. Is, you know, I think this team needs to get back down to the basics. I, I've been saying that for weeks. We've been saying that for weeks, but I, everything I, has to be pulling teeth with this team. Is you are so not good on offense is you know your stupid playbook doesn't mean anybody it doesn't impress anybody because you could have you could have this you know 800 play playbook that looks good on on Madden NFL but if your team is scoring no points except in garbage time then what what good is it what's the point you had a team last year that went to the Super Bowl and almost won, and their playbook was just run the damn ball. Like they just pounded it down your throat. And 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 this Bears team just can't figure that out. They can't figure out their identity because everything is they're they're they they're not physical. They're not their identity f- is puke. Yeah. It is it, uh you know, a few listeners to the show commented because I I posted the the gif of the uh, the Buffalo Bills fan puking, and it was like, "This is Ew. me watching. This is me watching the Bears offense." And you know, people recognize that uh, how often we talk about that, but it really is true. It's 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 absolutely abysmal how bad this offense is. And I think Matt Nagy needs to give up the play calling. I think it's time. I don't think you can wait until the bye week. I think you just have to be like, you know what. This is not working, and I think I think Matt Nagy is is a big part of the problem. And you know what makes me a little bit worried is that Matt Nagy is going to look at those garbage time points and say, "Oh well, we may be looking in a positive direction here." What what positive is there though? There isn't. There's none. You can't take away from that garbage time where you scored points unless unless you are going to unless you are going to be like you know what this is how we're going to run the offense it, f- from the opening drive and and you know you expect if you've got a bad offensive line with a lot of injuries and a lot of young starters trying to piece things together on the fly you you do things to help them out and help your quarterback quick passes screens slants to make the tight end your friend, you're and you one of your tight ends got six targets, the other one got zero, and I, I just I don't know what what to do. And you know the other drive you had when you came out at halftime, you're like, okay, you're down ten to nothing. That's not for most teams like that for the the Kansas City Chiefs. They scoff at halftime ten point deficit. Mm-hmm. Whatever. That's. I'll make that up in two minutes. But with the Bears, that's almost an insurmountable lead. And you come out of the second half and you have that nice drive. You have the 34-yard pass to Anthony Miller. And you're like, all right, if we come down and score a touchdown, we are right back into this game. Probably fires up the defense. And then you get down to a fourth down and one. And you don't even get a playoff. You have back-to-back penalties back to back penalties stupid bonehead penalties and that is that's how you, that drive ends you just it was disgusting i mean it was just vile to see i i just i'm just so disgusted by by how poorly disciplined this team is and uh you know, you, you, you can't, you have no margin of error for this team on offense. No, you don't. You don't. Yeah. Here we go. So, um, 
Oops. I just had it up. Um, third quarter, yeah. Uh, so you have, you hit the 34 yards to uh, to Anthony Miller. You followed up with a, a, a pass to Darnell Mooney that's incomplete. Um, then you run David Montgomery for four yards, which is probably one of his longest runs of the game. And then you have third and six, and you throw for five yards to to Cordero Patterson. So you come up with fourth and one. And then Arlington Hambright has the false start. Then Jimmy Graham has the false start. Back to back plays. A go, guy that who should just know better than that. Yeah, and, and so instead of uh, instead of being able to have a at least a field goal attempt, because you were at the thirty-one yard line of Tennessee. Yeah, all you on it really. The important thing in that situation was just getting points on the board. Yeah, is is had you had you even? Well, I mean, I guess that fourth down. If you don't, so if they would have got, kicked a field goal on fourth down, that's a forty. 49 yard field goal. I, I, they're in Tennessee. I imagine there's not the wind like here in Chicago. Probably. And look, I actually trust our kicker now. Yeah. So you kick that and you at least get points on the board. Or if you get the playoff, but then you get the first penalty and suddenly you're like, okay, well, now that makes it, you know, instead of a 49 yard, that's a 54 yarder. All right. Maybe. Maybe that's not uh, something we want to do. But then you get the next penalty. And it's it's so stupid. So stupid. That was the point where I basically just shut it off. I couldn't I, take it anymore. I came back towards the end when they they scored the first touchdown. That's when I... And I was just like, this is just garbage time. Like, this is garbage time. And I... I don't know how to process this because then you're like, oh, maybe he's starting giving me hope, but it's it's not that you know at the end of the game, uh, had had they recovered the onside kick, even the onside kick was just they there was it was so uneventful because there was no shot of getting it. No. And you know, really, what you need to do is that that Tennessee Titans team. Even though they're struggling a bit this season, that is a well-coached team. They have a mm-hmm. smart head coach, and you're not gonna you're not gonna put it on the ground ten yards and and have them make a stupid mistake. They did. They played it perfectly. They had up guys who let it go right past them, blocked the Bears, had a guy fall on it. Boom, easy done. What you need to do is you need to pop that up. That needs to go up in the air and let your guys run under and uh and try to you know try to get it that way. Yeah, I think you used the perfect word to describe it uneventful. Yeah, is once I saw the first the first you know time it hit the ground, I was like, "Ah, there's no way that this is they have any shot at this." And and in around the league the numbers of recovered onside kicks is way down, way down. Yeah. So it's already a difficult thing to do, and you're going against a well-coached team that doesn't that doesn't choke. Um, this is this is just not going to happen. And when you have a a you know not a good kick, it's it's just there's no it's a recipe for not happening, and that's what it was. And had they even got it. You know, they would have had, what, a minute left? Minute five? I it was just, about a minute four, I think. And you would have need to go on and on and score a touchdown. I just didn't feel like the Bears the Bears would have been able to do that. It would have been tough. With that little time where they were, it would have been tough. Yeah, it's just really hard to find the right words to describe how bad this offense really is. You can use all the bad words in the dictionary to describe it, honestly. I mean, it is 
It is so painful to watch. It is so aggravating to watch. Just seeing the same crap over and over. Questionable play calling, terrible line play, inconsistent quarterback play. I mean, let's be real. The quarterback play really is not very good at all. And I just nothing is coming together. And you watch virtually every other team in football outside mainly the Jets. And they don't struggle as much as the Bears do. I'm not talking about the Jets. I'm talking about pretty much everybody else. I mean, look at... Look at the Jaguars. They're not good, but look what Gardner Minshew was able to do with them the first few weeks. They were able to score points. Like, you can look at pretty much every other team, except the Jets, and see that they can at least at some point move the ball and score in bulks. And the only time you saw the Bears score in bulks was two miracle wins against Detroit and the Falcons. That's it. I'm going to tell you something that A, probably will not surprise you, but B will make you angry. Oh boy, here we go. The Chicago Bears are the most penalized team in the NFL, both in number of penalties and penalty yardage. Yeah, I'm not surprised. At this rate, I'm not surprised. They have 63 penalties on the season for 571 yards. And you know what? It always seems like those penalties come at the worst time. Yeah. Mind you, the New England Patriots have 20 penalties on the season. Wow. Well, even though they're not very good, good coaching will still show its ways. Yeah. So let me go halfway through here. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The halfway point, so like the, the team right in the middle is about 45, 46 penalties. And the Bears are at 63. Yikes. And the New England Patriots have 204 yards in penalties. The Bears have 571. 571 yards. So that's, so that's almost six football fields worth of penalties. Yeah. So they have four delay of games, um, which also leads the NFL. <laughs> well, of course, because they can, you know, their offense is so bad. They can, can't figure out sometimes how to be bad. Exactly. Uh, let's say four, uh, four, four, Def, uh, delay of games. You have uh, uh, is that false starts. You you don't lead. You're right up at the top of false starts, but you're not at number one. You're one, two, three. You're sixth in false starts. Still, that's top ten. Um, offensive holdings. Actually, where are the Bears on this one? I feel like they don't the, hold as much. No, they don't. They've only got four holding calls in the lead or in the, yeah, the season. Yeah, they don't hold very much. That's one thing they do, right? Um, they're towards the bottom on offensive pass interference. They don't have any. Uh. Offsides, I'm sure they're pretty bad about that. Is they're yeah, they're in the top ten in offsides. Um I'm gonna guess they're high up on neutral zone infraction. I think they they're calling that part of offsides. Yeah. Oh, okay, top. so it's all together. Yeah, that makes sense. Um let's see, come on. They're towards the. Uh, uh, uh. Oh, come on. This won't. Let's see. Uh, defensive holding. They are right there at the top on that. Uh, and why is the, my internet being slow? Maybe it's this page. Regardless, they are. They're a bad team as far as, as penalties go, and they're not good enough to overcome those. Um, 
illegal contact. Ooh, there's probably a bunch on those. They are one, two, three, fourth in the league in in illegal contact. This is just this is just bad. <laughs> like I they have so many penalties. And they're just not good enough to overcome them. And offensively, it's it's I get you can't become one dimensional and just pass, pass, pass. But this team, Matt Nagy, the runs that he's putting in are so so bad. They don't they're they don't give you a chance to be a positive run. You're not hitting the 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 line of scrimmage with some momentum. It's it's flat footed runs, slow low developing runs you have offensive linemen that are going ole ole and <laughs> you you haven't figured out how to run a screen pass like i watch i watch the saints i watch the the chiefs and i'm watching these teams run screen passes and i'm like everybody knows they're going to do it and they still are able to do it yeah, they actually pull it off, unlike us. The Bears are able to surprise teams and still can't get it off because they're they're just so poorly set up. I, I just, I, like, I'm at the point, honestly, where I'm ready for the Matt Nagy and Ryan Pace to be fired and just start a rebuild. You know, I, to go meatball here, I, I'm kind of at the point where if they finish the season and they don't make the playoffs. I think you clean house. I think you trade off what you can and just stock the hell up on draft picks. Like, I mean, here's the crazy part is Tennessee was giving up 128 yards of rushing per game. And your leading rusher at halftime had 11 yards. On a special teams play. Yeah. So your leading rusher, you ended up with 56 total yards of rushing. That's less than half of what they give up. That's how bad you were. The Bears ran for 56 yards, and 11 of those were on a special teams fake punt. You take that away, and you're at 45 yards. David Montgomery averaged 2.1 yards a carry. Cordero Patterson averaged 4.3. Yikes. I, I Like you literally just went from 5 a 5 and 1 start to 5 and 4. Mhm. In the blink of an eye. Like I, I just, Matt Nagy literally went from the NFC Coach of the Year, or maybe it was the NFL Coach of the Year. To, yeah, he was Coach of the Year. Yeah, to somebody that we're calling to get fired because I just this this offense is just gone downhill every single year. Yeah, it's 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 going backwards. Like, it is time that the, he hands off the play calling, and I don't know who's going to do it, if it's going to be Bill Lazor, the offensive coordinator, or, pew, 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 pew. Uh, or Dave Ragone, or John DiFilippo, but it's it's not working. And, you know, we need to rule out, is it is it Matt Nagy's play calling, or is it Matt Nagy's offensive system, or is it the players? And I'm starting to get to the point where... You know, you can't fully say it's not the players, but good coaching can put bad players in a place to win. You know, I, I watched Ben DiNucci play quarterback for the, the Cowboys, and it was it was as good as the quarterback play we've been getting. Yeah, what does that tell you? I mean, what does that tell you? And I don't know the extent of everybody's injury. Um, it, I think Jason Spriggs was COVID, so he might be back. Uh, 
but I, I don't know. This is just, this is so bad. And I don't know. And, and what's even more frustrating is fans all over the place when Buffalo Bills cut in the middle of the season, Quentin Spain, because of, we are not sure. We don't know what the situation was, but it wasn't, it wasn't his play. Like, and they cut him and the Bears didn't even kick the tires on him. And I'm like, man, we could have really used a capable offensive lineman. And he went to to Cincinnati and is the starter there. On a team that's starting to figure things out because they have a running game and they have their future quarterback for a long time. Yep. Who looks like the real deal. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. And we are going to we are going to move on from Trubisky, and we're not gonna have a good enough draft pick to draft Trevor Lawrence, who might not even come out now, because apparently he does not want to go to the Jets. <laughs> Can you blame him? I don't know. Oh, God, that's a bad team. But so you're gonna have one less quarterback going out. What do you what do you do? Do you do you overdraft? You know one of the 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 quarterbacks that probably should be a late first round or early second rounder and draft him in the middle of the second or the first round. Maybe you do, and then pray that they're good. But um, you know you pray you get a Ben Roethlisberger rather than a rather than a Ryan Tannehill. I mean, I think at some point you might have to reach for something you need, whether it's line or quarterback in the draft. That's why it's it's going to be interesting to see how the Bears end this season because if they're more enticed to do a rebuild and maybe you make some trades and you stock up on some picks, that could kind of change the way you approach the draft. You know, because I right now I see them finishing around 500, so that's going to be right in the middle. Like you said, it's not high enough to get top-tier talent, but... You know, you're not low enough where you're saying, you know what, it's a late first round pick, but that's because we made the playoffs and we went on a good run. It's not because of either of those. It's basically you're stuck in the middle. And that is really not where the Bears want to be in this situation unless, you you know, you make some trades, you trade up. We're a long ways away from that, but I think you're going to have to get to a point where you might have to overdraft for a need. And the thing is, is, we're looking at it now. I'm looking at a mock draft and they have quarterback going number one. And that's Trevor Lawrence. And I don't oh, know. If he, I don't know if he goes out because yeah, like I said, he's, he's rethinking things. Um, Justin Fields quarterback going number two. Uh, da, da, da. Um, Zach Wilson quarterback going seven. Trey Lance quarterback going nine. So you have four quarterbacks in the top 10 picks. I don't know how many first round quarterbacks they expect in this draft going through here. Um, Oh, here we go. They predict Mac Jones quarterback, Alabama going first overall. I mean, uh, First pick for the Bears, number 18 overall. So you have Khalil Mack and Mack Jones. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, yeah, he's a quarterback with mediocre ap- athleticism and good but not great arm strength. And according to this, I don't grade him as a first rounder. La di da. Uh, and so that just makes it worse if if Trevor Lawrence doesn't come out. That moves everybody up one. Oh, man. Going to have to overreach to get a quarterback. Uh, it's It's brutal out there, man. It's brutal, and it's not going to get any easier. I'm looking, you know, at the schedule, and and you know, the Vikings, 
they're not a good team, but they're not a pushover either. And if no. the Bears can't figure out what the hell they're doing on offense and cut out penalties, I don't see them beating the Vikings and they fall to 500 just like that with their fourth consecutive loss. With Green Bay right around the corner. Yeah, going into the bye, needing a win against Green Bay. At, that's that's a that's not the spot you want to be in. No. 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 It's not good. It's it's not good. It you know, if you would have come back beaten the Saints and beaten the Titans today, you would have looked back at that Rams game and just shrugged it off. But now you're on a three game losing streak. You've gone from five and one to five and four, and pretty much everything that we were worried about catching up to them has caught up to them. I mean, that's where we are. And and I said, you know, this this stretch of three games here was gonna be tough. Nobody expected them to win all three. Even if they were as good as they were in the first five games, I was like, this would have been a tough stretch. And I was like, if you can pull out one win here, then you feel like, okay, we're okay. Because then you're six and three. You're six and three, and you feel at least competent, and you can go in and beat Vikings, confident and competent. And you go seven and three. And you're like, all right, seven and three is a tough record to not make the playoffs. Like that's that's tough. But now you're at the point you lost all three, and you lost them in in such sensational fashion of being piss poor on offense. That how 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 do they envision beating the Minnesota Vikings? Well, like I said earlier, at, at this rate, I think you're just going to have to beat them with your defense. You're going to need to create some turnovers and a pick six or two. And that's that you can't you can't count on that. And when no, you're, you can't. When you're playing to get turnovers and and touchdowns on defense, you're gonna you're gonna make mistakes. And mm-hmm. you know, I, I see them. I see the only way that this happens is is the Bears drag this out to, you know, like a six to six game into the fourth quarter, and then and then they get that one drive where they get a touchdown. But it's gonna have to be the Bears defense keeping this game close and the Bears eking something out at the end. I that's the only way. And then that's and the Bears defense is going to have to play pretty flawless to make that happen. Yep. And now Dion Bush is uh, on the COVID list. Oh, wonderful. It just gets better. Um, Lechavia Simmons, the offensive lineman, it tested positive. Um. The Bears are expected to sign veteran offensive lineman Eric Cush, assuming he can pass COVID protocols and pass a physical. Uh, So bad. I I just don't know what else to say. I I don't know either. We talk about the same shit all the time. Ugh. Um, I mean, let's, let's move on here. Um, so uh, briefly, you know, we talk bulls. I, we'll talk more once the NBA draft happens. Maybe we could get your brother on and big Dave. Um, yeah, that'd but, be great. We should do that. Uh, I, but you know, they're in a weird position there. It's not the fourth overall pick. It's nothing to sneeze at, but they're the top three. There's three top guys in this draft, and odds of you getting one without trading up is pretty low, uh, unless somebody somebody reaches, and you have somebody fall. But um, you know, the, your potential guys here, uh, you, you know, you're not you're going for. I guess what you're looking for is is potential upside to fit in with with what you have 
um, with Kobe White, Zach Levine, Wendell Carter, Laurie Markkinen, um, and and I'm looking at what Joe Colley is saying is that he's got a um, Denny Avdija as as the guy. He's He's a foreign player from Tel Aviv, power forward, or six foot seven guy. Not power. He was. Uh, he'd be replacing Otto Porter Jr. eventually. Um, but these are these are guys that I don't know. I just don't get a the tingly feelies about. You know, you would love to have the opportunity for like a Lamelo Ball. I just don't. I don't see him falling that far. And I don't see the Bulls trading up to get him because you'd have to trade up quite a bit to move up, you know, two spots, three spots. No, I don't. I don't think that's going to happen. You know, Wiseman, Edwards, and, and Ball are going to be the top three guys, and then, um, you know, you, you're left with what's left. You know, and it's 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 kind of like a consolation prize almost, like. Sure, it's much better to pick four than seven or eight. You, you know, you get a better shot of finding a guy that fits, but you just don't get those elite guys that that you, are game changers. It's one of those things where you're in a situation. You got a, a, a solid draft pick fourth. It's not a draft that's. You don't want to call it bad, but it's not like in recent years past. And you know when we had. Uh, Moran and those guys in the draft and oh, what's his face that went to New Orleans um, why am I blanking on his name the first overall pick oh um, oh my why am I blanking on his name why Just am I blanking on his I have I'm old so you know that's uh, I remember Morant obviously Zion, Zion Williamson why could Zion Williamson that? yes thank yeah. you so yeah, John Mar- John Morant is great, and I I remember I remember uh, just waiting at the uh, the draft lottery party that that the uh, Ball on Bulls had downtown, and the whole crowd there was just just like we just need to get you know a top two pick. We need John Morant, and and I I remember I remember Big Dave talking about that. That's going to be the guy, and Zion has the potential to be like a, an absolute stud. He's, but Ja has been absolutely fantastic. Yeah, and I think that uh, he would be a really good fit on the Bulls. I think he'd be a real good fit on most teams. Well, yes. I just mean, you know, you, you look at Zion Williamson, you look at Morant, they'd obviously, you'd take both of them, but I think Morant would have been a really nice fit with the Bulls going forward. Uh, you know, at, with... The, I, Let's just hope that Kobe White takes a big step forward this year and, and you see some some good things from him. I still like him. I still am a big, big Kobe White guy. I think he does have the skills to be a good player in this league. And I'm excited to see how he plays in a coaching system that actually isn't Bill's fan puke-esque. It, Where you're not you know, calling timeouts with two seconds left. You know what's funny is you you watch Kobe White on TV and you think he's he's little because he's not he's not a big build guy. Um, but then when you see him in a still picture next to guys you know how tall they are, and you're like, oh man, Kobe White's actually real tall. <laughs> yeah, he's bigger than you think. I, I and it's not just the hair. Um, you know what? And I don't know why I didn't bring this up before. Not, sorry to go back to the, the Bears. But Friday night, my wife took our dog for a walk. And then my dog doesn't like to pee on walks. She waits till she gets back in our yard. Um, so my wife brought the dog back in the yard. And mind you, I live inside the city of Chicago. I don't live in, in the boonies or in the suburbs. I live in the city. My wife lets the dog out. Dog was charging over. Guess what was in my yard? Hmm. 
there was a skunk. Oh, fun. So my dog got sprayed in the face by the skunk. And my wife screams for me. I go running outside. And before I could even stop to think, like, all right, what are we going to do here? The skunk starts running at us. And so we, the gate to like the side of the fence is right by the side door. So there's really the width of, width of a sidewalk distance. You know, there's nowhere for us to go other than in the house because we're sort of pinned by the, the skunk. And I, I imagine the skunk was just scared and trying to figure a way out. But I opened the door and the dog ran in and the dog stinks. My house stinks. I can't, I've washed my hands like a hundred times. I can't get the smell off my hands. You use tomato juice? I was reading online. It doesn't work that well. They they recommended if you can't buy the actual commercial stuff that, that's a neutralizer for skunk uh, to use a mixture of uh, hydrogen peroxide, baking soda, and dish detergent or dish soap. So we did that until, because it was at I don't know, like 10 o'clock at night. So there was no store open to buy skunk spray so we got skunk spray the next day which actually worked pretty well in the dog but it will not get it off my hands anyway so my house stinks and uh, we couldn't open the windows at that time because the spray was right outside the window and it smelled like you know the skunk smell oh, that's yeah. what it smells like from a distance when you get it up close it smells like a fire at an oil and t old tire factory. Um, that's what it smells like. Just burning oil and tires. <laughs> and so we couldn't open the windows. Anyways, the point is that that was the stinkiest thing in my house until I turned on the Bears game. I was going to say, like, um, are you going to make a Bears connection there that it was still more pleasant than watching the Bears? It was it. The Bears game was stinkier. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I've smelled skunk before. We have millions of skunks in our neighborhood in Elmhurst. They are everywhere. I've smelled them plenty, plenty of times. Especially the one that got road killed right in front of our house the one time. I can definitely agree that watching the Bears was worse than experiencing that. Yeah, it was weird because like my wife at first was like, you know, I, I open the door in the back to see if the skunk was gone and she's like i couldn't smell it anymore so it seemed like it went away maybe we can open the windows I'm like that doesn't seem right and she like opened the door at ground zero i opened the front door because that's where i was closest to and in the f i opened it and i i couldn't smell it but i could taste it it was just so pungent. Just, i like everything afterwards i think it did go into my mouth it was like in the air and i was like and I was like, how, how do you have like COVID nose that like you can't smell? Like that's just, it's, it is like just uh, a Buffalo <clears throat> Bills fan puking thinking about it. Yeah. But, yeah. So it's like every, like everything smelled like the, I was like, how does this even work? And I, I didn't know, I guess I, I was very. Uh, ignorant of the skunk spray situation it is like it's like an oil that they spit out it is not yeah like a, i thought it was like a you know like a, like a fart almost it, yeah it's now, not a gas it's like an oil yeah it's an oil so like i saw like where it hit my dog it hit her like right on the, the lower jawline because it was like a yellow sludgy compound Ew. Yeah, it was like streaked, like basically right along her jawline, and I was like, "Oh my god!" It was it was so gross, and we ran her right down to the basement. We have a, a full bathroom in the basement. And I just ran her into the shower, and and then apparently, you know, because when this is all happening on the fly, um, you don't you, you don't take the time to research, but apparently they said. Make that mixture of the baking soda, the peroxide, and the the soap, and apply that first to kind of cut through the oil, 
because if you just put soap and water at first, it sort of digs it into the fur. It makes it harder to get the smell out. And I was like, well, there we go. <laughs> there we go. Like, I feel like, I feel like sometimes I, I need to figure out the things I don't know and learn them in, just in case. <laughs> yeah, you got to be a skunk expert now. I know, because we see them all the time. Like, they are they are like in full force in my neighborhood. Like, we go f take the dog for a walk, and I would say if we don't see a skunk three times a week, then that's an anomaly. Like, we see them all the time. But I think a few years ago, the Chicagoland area skunk population, like, tripled. Yeah, but, you know, it was weird. I was not expecting them in our yard because we have a fenced-in yard, and... Um, Oh, they so they find ways to burrow, man. They they get through. Yeah, so that's, and so like that means in a week span, my dog uh, caught a possum and got sprayed by a skunk in our backyard. All in one week, huh? Mm, well. in, in, in in not a calendar week, but in a seven day span, yeah. <laughs> fun, fun, fun. Um. What else do we have sports wise? Uh, Tim Tim Anderson making comments that he's going to still be him regardless of what Tony Larusa has to say. Which good. Tim Anderson is much more important in this team than Tony Larusa. Yeah, I agree. Um, Francisco Lindor is on the trade block. That's Where do you think he's going to go? I don't know. I really don't. I think I have an idea where he's going to go. Where do you think? L.A. <laughs> Just what L.A. needs. They're going to have Mookie uh, Betts and Francisco Lindor. I mean, that's going to be such bullshit if that happens. It's like they have unlimited amounts of money. They have unlimited money, trade assets, and prospects. Yeah, how how do they have that high of a payroll, that good of a of an MLB team, and that good of a farm system all at the same time? It's not fair. Yeah, there's no there's no financial constraints. They're just like, pfft, spend spend away. Yeah, yeah. I do. I you, there there is some good stuff that I did want to share though, really quick with uh, baseball. I'm sure you've heard of it too. Um, did you hear that not only we had two Cubs gold glove winners, but the Cubs won the team gold glove? No, I didn't hear that. Yeah, they are the team gold glove winner. Uh, Anthony Rizzo and Javier Baez won the individual gold gloves, and the best defensive team in the league that would win the team gold glove, the Cubs won that as well. And Jason as Hay I said... Jason Hayward didn't win one? No, Jason surprisingly Hayward? no. Huh. Hmm. No, he did not. I mean, we all know he's still gold glove caliber no matter what, but no surprise in Rizzo. I mean, he wins one pretty much every year, and then Baez finally gets his gold glove. Um, but, you know, like I said last week, on last week's show, the offense sucked for the Cubs. I mean, it was an embarrassing train wreck, but, you know, David Ross had his team playing very good fundamental baseball on the field. And I think that is well reflected by the way they play defense. And they just edged out, according to the Sabre metrics, uh, some of the d defensive metrics, the Cubs just edged out the Cardinals in that defensive metric to help get that Gold Glove team award. Yeah, we, we talked about the year before that uh, defensively the, the Cubs took a step backwards. And a that would have been. Yeah, and that, and especially since they didn't have a lot of turnover in personnel, it was just individual play. It was kind and of that, fluky. Yeah, it was it was fluky and we're like, okay, well that needs to that needs to improve. That's got to improve for the Cubs to be better and they did. That was that was a concrete thing that they they took to and, and did. So, that's um you know, that's good. Um It's just a shame, man. Imagine if that team was able to hit Oh, hitting. I remember hitting. Me too. You know what my brother, he just told me, since he lives in Wrigleyville by uh, the Wrigleyville bars, him and my sister-in-law were able to get um, some beer from John's Tab. 
Okay. That, that sounded like a really... If I was in the area, I would have done that. That was a really cool thing he did. Yeah. Very cool. Do you think he's going to be back on a shorter deal? No. I don't. You don't think he'll be back? I can see him coming back. Do I think they should bring him back? Uh, I'm not so sure. I mean, the tank is pretty much empty with Lester. And you can, I mean, we all appreciate the hell of what he did. I mean, there's no question that he was an absolute monster on the mound when we needed him most when they were winning in 2016. Even when he came in the World Series Game 7 and he got up to the rough start, he buckled down and pitched great. He was the co-NLCS MVP, multi-time All-Star. He did everything he needed to do. But just at this point, he's old. The stuff isn't there anymore. I'd really like to see them go after some younger arms. I hate to be the one to say this. I have a feeling they're going to try to fill that whole rotation in-house. I think they're going to try to do much of that rotation in-house. I agree. I think they're going to try to use Adbert Alzali. I think they may look at some of their other prospects. They're not going to go out and make a big splash. I, Trevor Bauer, not happening. Marcus Stroman, probably not may, happening. Maybe they try to bring Tyler Chatwood back. It's possible. I, it's possible. But I think I think of the five, so they the two we've got slotted, I think t- at least two more will be in-house. Yeah, I agree. And then... Maybe they take a flyer on somebody that missed all of 2019 and part of 2018 with like a Tommy John or something. Um, they like to do that. A guy yes, that they do, and and have that person compete for the for a rotation spot. Uh, I think that's what they're going to yeah. do. I think it's going to be. I don't think we're getting any surprises. Um, no, no. I I think. I think this team is what it is. We we know who's going to catch. We know, um, you know, we have a good idea who's going to play most to second base. I think maybe they sign a low end second base free agent. Um, maybe even bring Kipnis back. Uh, we know who's playing first. We know who's playing short. We know who's playing third. Unless uh, he's think, traded. Yeah. Um, but if he's traded, I think David Bodie's then third baseman or Javi's yeah. third and Bodie short, whatever. We know who the infield will be still. It'll just be Bodie s- sliding into one of the positions. Um, and I mean, outfield, you know, you're Hap's not going anywhere and Hayward's not going anywhere. I think you know that. Yeah. And I don't think you get a value out of trading Schwarber. So what's the point I mean, other than salary cap relief? I think if there's going to be a Schwarber trade, it's going to be part of a package deal. It's not just going to be him versus some prospects. It might be him and another player for a return. Yeah. So, you know, maybe maybe you you pick up a couple of road, uh, bullpen arms on the on the cheap. Yeah, I mean you're going to have to. Uh, but this this roster really is what it is. I, I mean. I don't. I don't think. I don't think we spend much. You know, maybe maybe a million and a half on a couple. You know, two two bullpen arms for a million and a half to three million dollars each, and then a low end starter that's under. You know, under five million dollars. They're not spending more than five million dollars on a starter. Period. So, yeah, and the, the difference, the slight difference might be based on how many pumpkins were sold at Gallagher Wing. <laughs> well, come down to Gallagher Wing. Every time you buy a pumpkin, we'll spend eight more cents on a free agent. <laughs> I'm going to look, let's see, I'm going to look right now at free agent pitchers, starting pitchers, because, I mean, we, uh, we pretty much eliminated um the ones, the big ones like Stroman and Bauer, I just, I, I, I'm not saying Bauer wouldn't want to come here. I just don't think the Cubs are going to pony up for what he wants. And you know, Bauer's been the type of guy that's 
has gone on and said, I like to sign one-year deals. But even if you do sign a one-year deal, it's not going to come cheap. No, You're going to have to spend a lot of money for one year. Trevor Bauer is going to go whoever pays him the most money, period. Yeah. And that will not be the Cubs, period. So. Okay, so here's some... uh, Oh, oh. Here's somebody I could see them going after. Jeff Samarja is going to be available. (laughs) Uh, That would be funny. I wonder... Somebody on Cubby's crib wrote about it. It wasn't me. It was somebody else. Uh, They mentioned a possible Cole Hamels reunion, but he's... He's just been hurt the past year and a half. Yeah, and he's what, going to be 40? He is 37. Yeah, he is, like, I, the guy's been on a Hall of Fame career path, has done some great things, it's just time for him to hang him up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He's just, he's at the end of his ropes, and he was very good for most of his Cubs tenure. Very good, very pleasant surprise. But we saw after that one injury that he just wasn't the same after that in 2019. And you know what? When you're older like that, sometimes all it takes is for one injury, a few missed weeks to just go off the rails. Oh boy, Jordan Zimmerman's available. Oh, Charlie Morton. What is with you and Charlie Morton? I don't know. He's an old guy like me. Yeah, he's 37. Um, James Paxson, Rick Porcello. Oh, boy, Anibal Sanchez is available. You know who's available? Not a pitcher, but Tommy LaStella. Well, I know they've been interested in him, bringing him back. And we could use a guy that could put the ball in play. Ooh, you know who else is going to be a free agent, I believe? Jake Arietta. Oh, yeah. People have brought that up. <laughs> he's kind of washed, too. Oh, he's totally washed. Which You know, I was just going to point out. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Which uh, I'm not going to say it out loud, but it just makes me insinuate some things. The way things just really skyrocketed up and then skyrocketed down. Yeah, I'm not going to say one thing or another. And I still don't want to believe he was, like, on, you know, roids. But, yeah, I I know what you're saying. It's just how meteoric the rise was up and then how quickly it just went down. Because we knew. Yeah. we. I mean, he went from mediocre starter that Orioles were just willing to move on from to Bob Gibson. Mm-hmm. And then had a couple good years, but then he just like it really came back down to earth. I mean, not right back down to earth like like a meteor, but you know there was a lot of chinks in that armor. And there when, was. And when the yes. when he left the Cubs, there was like I think most Cubs fans were like thanks, but no thanks. Adios. Uh, I don't, yeah, Dar- getting Darvish was the right move. Yeah, and and I remember there was Phillies fans that were just like, "Oh, so that was a dumb decision by the Cubs. Look what he's doing, and Darvish is hurt." But and you look what we got now. Um, and Arietta is just doesn't look like the same guy. He's available, I but I do this. not want him. Yeah, I'm going to pass on him too. And I will say this about Arietta and Philly: he's had a number of injuries. And obviously that could take a toll, but you know, I don't want to just accuse him for being on something. I get why there'd be suspicion. It could just simply be one of those rare cases where a guy just finds some prime for a few years and then just kind of falls back down. It it does happen, but I can't tell you 100% one thing happened or another. If he would have just risen and stayed consistently good then you just say, you know what? He just had to work a few things out, and then he figured it out. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, had had there been, had he, st- yeah, it was just how short that window was, and 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 how high the highs were that he, you know, for for that year and a half, like he was just unhittable. 
I also do watch some of his pitching, and you saw how the breaking balls moved when he was in his prime, and you saw how the pitches moved. And, you know, it, one could maybe speculate that part of the decline, I'm not saying it's the whole reason, but part of the decline could be attributed to they just kind of did their homework and they laid off certain pitches and they waited back on other certain pitches and people just kind of figured him out. I, I, don't, I don't have a definitive answer for you. You can piece together some theories and ideas, but, you know, regardless, I think that his days as a Cub uniform are over and I loved watching him when he was in his prime. From 14 to 16, it was fun as hell, but I don't want to look back in that direction way past when it was good. Uh, for the future. Here's a couple of interesting names um, that I guess could could be. I mean, well, here's here's past their prime guys that I'm I'm curious of what'll happen. Well, Cole Hamels, I think, will sign a one year deal with somebody. Um, Lester will sign a one year deal, I think, with somebody. Arietta probably signs a one year deal with somebody. Mm-hmm. What does Corey Kluber get? Yeah, that's a good question. I think a lot of people are going to be wondering that because Corey Kluber is obviously not the multi-time Cy Young winner he used to be when he was just dominating. I mean, he was one of the best pitchers in baseball, and year in, year out, he was very good. But, you know, you look at now, I mean, he started one game in 2020. And the year before, he played in only 35.2 innings, and he threw to a 580 ERA. Now, the year before that, 33 starts, 289 ERA. So he was like himself, you know, two years ago. But the last two seasons, you know, you've played a grand total of eight games in two seasons. And you are in your mid-30s now. It's not like you're still in your 20s. Yeah, it's, you just wonder if he's got some bounce back in him at all or if he's just, like, washed up. But out of those three names, out of those four, those four names, Lester, Arietta, Hamels, and Kluber, uh, I would say Kluber would be the only one I would kick the tires on. Yeah, because, you know, if you get him and you take a waiver on him and if he stays healthy, then you can probably see some of the old Kluber come through where – John Lester is just at an age where he is just simply past his prime. Just simply past it. Yeah, he is just going to be a junk ball pitcher, and it's going to be it's going to be a struggle to go through games. Cole Hamels, I think, if he could stay healthy, like he's just a, still a fluid pitcher. I think his stuff is still there. It's just he's injured. Um, yeah, I, I think Arietta injuries, and I think his stuff is gone. That fastball has yep. dropped a lot of velocity. Corey, yep. Corey Kluber, I, I don't know. I just don't know what you have. But if you, of those of those four names, if I had to pick one, man, I, I would see what the medicals came back on Corey Kluber. I mean, if if his medicals don't look good, uh, I mean, Lester, if you had to pick one of those four, Lester, just because of health. but Yeah, at least with Lester, you can rely on him taking the ball every five days. Yeah, but... I think Corey Kluber would be, if if health was still, you know, not an issue, I would probably he'd be the only one I'd kick the tires on. Yeah. But, but years here's a few names that I'm I'm not saying the Cubs go after. I'm just saying I'm curious of what happens to them because they are guys that people were very high on that have cooled significantly, but are still young enough where. They could have bounce backs. Robbie Ray, Jose Quintana, Chris Archer. I don't want Chris Archer. Robbie Ray, I think, could be a, a decent four. Jose Quintana, this is my unpopular opinion. I'm completely okay re signing him. If he comes at a good price, I'd re sign him. Yeah, I, honestly, I would too. I mean, this year was the fluky with the the cut, and then the, you know, I, but you you didn't get anything out of him this year. But he 
He wasn't worth what we paid for him, but he wasn't bad. Had we just paid money for him, nobody would have been mad based on what we paid pay we're paying him in salary. Right. It was just what we paid for him in in players. Uh, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, it, it's cuz if you look at if they would have if they would have signed him as a free agent and paid him that amount of money, nobody would have been upset with him at all. Yeah, nobody would be blinking, nobody would be batting an eye. And I mean, the thing with Quintana is if you look at the game logs, a vast majority of them are good. 6 7 innings, 3 runs or less. It's just you had those games where he'd give up like seven, eight runs, and the stats would just balloon. And the big thing that was missing that he had on the south side was consistency. But, you know, overall, the body of work, while the overall numbers are mediocre, you know, if you just look at the majority of the starts, it's more good than bad. Is he all-star Cy Young caliber? No, but you, you've gotten plenty of good starts from him. So Bleacher Bleacher Nation is projecting Quintana to make somewhere around eleven million dollars a year. Well, I think he needs to be willing to take cheaper if he's going to stay here. Yeah, that's the thing is somebody else might be willing to pay that extra. I don't know. The White Ooh. Sox? No, he's not going back there. I mean, you know what? I'm, I mean, they, he didn't leave there on bad terms. No, I mean they traded him for a rebuild. I I don't I I could see him going back there. Um Yeah. But the, the, at least the White Sox, we know they're going to make moves. They're going to be going after one at least one uh, middle of the rotation guy. They're not going to go after a bottom, bottom of the rotation starter. They're going to look no. at. They're going to look at a two or a three. Um, you know that that upper middle of the rotation type guy, maybe even a top line guy. Um, I mean, it would be smart to go after a, a Trevor Bauer. Um, I, I think that could really set them up. Uh, they can they can live with the, the crappy right field production they're getting because they have so many other bats. And mm -hmm. and I, I think you have enough guys that you could put out there to give you a, um, you know, a replacement level, uh, you know, ability. You know, so I think right field is a luxury for them. Um, but I think they need, they need, another starting pitcher, a, a top line kind of guy. So I think if, if money is an issue with them, I think they can go after a Trevor Bauer and then call it a, you know, and then, and then cobble together some other things. Uh, but right field would be, would be a, a dream for them. I think if they can, if mm -hmm. they could pad that. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, imagine, imagine their top three pitchers of, you have, we have Giolito, uh, Dallas Keuchel, and Trevor Bauer. That They're just, winning a World Series right there. Yeah, that that really, um, you know, that really is a a a, a tough a tough road to uh, to to win against if you're another team. Very much so. It is funny though. What if they added like a Marcelo Zuna and put him in right field? <laughs> you would have a, a piss poor defensive outfield other than center. Your left and right fielders would be brutal. But man, would you have some You'd be making up for it offensively. Offensively, you would just be clobbering teams. If you could throw a Marcelo Zuna with that slash line of 338, 431, 636, and throw him in the mix there. Like, like that, he's, is is there a better bat in the free agent market this year than Marcelo Zuna? Let me look at the list. He's definitely one of the best. There's no doubt about that. Let me look at the official list here. 
Uh, da, 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 da. Gotta change this from pitchers to all batters. All right, let's see here. Da, 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 da. So, you have Yohannes Cespedes, George Springer, Ryan Braun, Carlos Santana, Yadi Molina, Sinsu Chu, Marcelo Zuna, Justin Turner, Michael Brantley, Nelson Cruz, Didi De Gregorius, Jay Bruce, Josh Reddick, Marcus Simeon, Brett Gardner, DJ LeMayhew, Edwin Encarnacion, Daniel Murphy, Jackie Bradley Jr., Marwan Gonzalez, D. Gordon, Jed Lowry, JT Real Muto, Wilson Ramos, Edgelton Simmons, Jonathan Villar, Jock Peterson, Jason Castro, Robinson Chirinos, Cesar Hernandez, Howie Kendrick, Jonathan Scope, CJ Crone, Enrique Hernandez, Jerkson Profar, James McCann, Colton Wong, Kurt Suzuki, Freddie Galvis, Todd Frazier, Anna Meaton, Mark Zanino, Eric Sogard, Alex Avila, Kevin PR, Austin Romine, Tyler Flowers, Nick Markakis, Alex Gordon, who I think is retiring, Eric Thames, Robbie Grossman, Michael Taylor, Tommy Lastella, Jeff Mathis, Mitch Moreland, Mikel Franco, Joe Panic, Ashubal Cabrera, Dan Descalso, Sandy Leone, Matt Wieters, Ryan Zimmerman, and so on and so forth. So I think um, your best overall hitter right now might be DJ Mayhew, but you know, for, and you have a good power bat in um, Edwin Encarnacion, but Marcelo Zuna is right up there. What about, what about Michael Brantley for the White Sox? Well, they're very familiar with him, that's for sure. How many years was he with the Indians? Uh, I mean, Let's see. that guy, that guy's got an amazing contact rate and a really low strikeout rate. I think, I think that could be a for good the White fit. Sox. Bring him to the Cubs. I want that guy in the Cubs. <laughs> I mean, that would be nice in there to 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 throw the mix in because you'd have Tim Anderson, a contact guy. You have uh, what's his nuts at second base. Uh, what's his nuts? <laughs> what's his nuts? <laughs> I'll say, you know, looking at his stats, really good. I mean, his last two years in Houston, uh, batting over 300 each time, uh, OBP of 640, 6, uh, 364 or better, um, 1.5 war 2020 in 46 games played. That's pretty good. And he had 22 home runs in 2019. He's a good ball player. Yeah, I mean, I think Nick Madrigal, who's I'm thinking of. So you, you have a good contact what's guy. His what's his nuts? Nick Madrigal. Uh, he, he good contact guy. Tim Anderson, good contact guy. Uh, you could throw Michael Brantley in there, good contact guy. And that makes up for some of the other guys that are strikeout, but home run guys. Um, I think that makes you a really well-balanced offense it is not mm -hmm. all home run or bust. Um, Delve that to the north side team. The, I think the problem with Cubs partly is that they are all oh, on base percentage guys. Like, and I think at some point is they wait for such a perfect pitch. You don't see any, anybody swinging good pitches. Like it's like, there's like too much patience. It's like, swing a little bit and and they swing it when they do swing it's at terrible pitches not the ones that they've it's like they have good eye on, at balls but then they're not they don't swing at the strike zone uh, it's it's a little bit frustrating you're just like how how do you do you have a team that that draws their walks but then can't make contact like what the hell goes on there well i'm very glad you mentioned that because there is something to be said about that it, you look, getting on base is important. Having guys that could get on base is important, but you want to have guys that are batting after those guys get on base that could just put the ball in play. I would sacrifice a high BABIP, high contact, low OBP guy to put in the lineup after you have guys drawing walks. If not everybody gets on base, but they could put the ball in play and have a high contact rate, who cares about their OBP? It, it's, it's all about balance. And there is something to be said because the Cubs, here's what they do. You know, they they draw their walks very well. They got good eyes, but they swing through way too much. When you have batters, like the ones on the Cubs, that have holes in their bats when the ball is in the strike zone, that's a problem. They might not chase outside, but if you throw to their weak spots, because they have some notable weak spots, that's where you get those swings and misses. 
I want a guy that maybe will expand a little bit, but he will just make contact. He will put the bat on the ball. If you have Anthony Rizzo and Chris Bryant drawing walks, and then you can get a guy up there that can just put the damn ball in play and either move the runners or get them in. That is so important. So I'm very glad you said that. Yeah, it's it's just frustrating, and we know what those Cubs problems are, and they're the ownership is not willing to put in the financial capital to to resolve it. Um, I think they made one too many uh, Wrigleyville renovations. They've got the money. It's not that. It's it, it, here's the thing: is they bought this team. They didn't buy this team because they love the team. They bought this team as a financial investment, and they're going to make it back in spades at some point because that real estate alone, like once, I mean, this the franchise is going to keep going up because that's what sports teams do, uh, but then that real estate around it is just going to be worth so much with what they, they built up. Because it does look so much nicer than it did. It does. It uh, does. It was good they did the renovations. And they're going to get that TV money in a year or so. So that's any consolation. So yeah, they'll get the TV money. And then just the, their their holdings are going to be worth so much money. That at some point, they'll be able to flip this and make a metric poop ton of money. Because And more pumpkins at Gallagher Wayne. Yeah. They, they have no interest in... When they sold this idea to to old man Ricketts to part the ways with the money. It was because they sold it as this team makes money whether they win or lose. And this is the attendance when they win or lose. And it was a financial investment. Sure, they probably grew up Cubs fans and they were like, oh, well, this we could buy a team we like and make money. But the the second part was the the – the more important thing for them is to make that money. Well, they are business people, so it's no surprise. Uh, so it's not that the the passion and love there is, you know, as much as you can shit all over the McCaskies, is Virginia loves this team. It's, it's in her blood. It's all she's known her whole life is nothing but the Chicago Bears. And, and the Ricketts, they're just rich people to begin with. Like this is this is just an investment for them. You know what I really would love to see in the near future? I would love to see the Cubs go out and acquire a free agent bat that I mean the the last big free agent bat they got was Jason Hayward. And I mean, you know, at the time he was the big free agent bat. You know, since then, you know, we got you Darvish and spent a lot on payroll. I just want to see them go out and get a big bat. Not, no more Daniel Descalso's and Steven Souza Jr.'s and, guy, you know, other guys that are old and past their prime or injured. Uh, I just, I, I want to hear the big news that they signed a big bopper. And we're not just relying on guys we've tried to make into something, even though they're not coming along the way they hoped. Well, who would be the big bat you would want to get and where would you put them? Well, I know it's not going to happen, but I would love DJ LeMayhew. I, I I know Nico Horner this, but you know what? DJ LeMayhew is an established star player. So what do maybe you... you try to move Nico Horner? Okay, I'm okay with that. I mean, think about. It. I mean, I like Nico Horner. I think there's some upside, but right now, who'd you rather have? Him or an all-star that still is in his prime? I think the answer is obvious. Right. I thought you were going to say, you know, if, if if I had my dream, I thought it was going to say me to win a lot of money and then buy the Bears and, and build a trebuchet for anybody that, that sucked and just launch them into Lake Michigan. Well, we could do that too. That would be my dream, you know, to be like King George, but own the Bears. And, you know, you you don't just fire coaches you are, or bad players. You really launch them, physically launch them. <laughs> Boing. I, I, 
just so I'm just numb at this point with the Bears. Yeah, not to, me not too. to look back around. It's just this is a lost season. It's and it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be a lost season. This should be a season where they they should be competing. This defense is very good. The offense should should be much, much better than it is. And it is arguably the worst offense in the NFL. I would say it is the worst. The only thing I would say is maybe worse is the Jets, but the Jets are just a train wreck all around. I think if you take away the Jets, then I'd definitely say the Bears. I mean, Jacksonville is really bad. Uh, the Redskins offense, pretty bad. You mean the Washington football team? Sorry, the Washington football team. But, you know, to be fair, did you see the injury of the quarterback today? No. All right, what have happened? You, have you ever seen the movie The Exorcist? Yes. You know how uh, her head spins around? Yes. All right, that's what happened to their quarterback's ankle. Oh. His foot was like a helicopter. <laughs> and who was this? Uh, Kyle Allen, their quarterback. Oh, wow. It's watch. I don't know. Don't watch it. Don't watch the injury. No, I, I can't. I, I can't. I can't. I, watch it. I can't yeah, I, I'm squeamish with injuries. Like uh, I just, I just remember the Alex Smith injury, and I don't even wanna. Oh, the Alex Smith one. Oh. What, what was worse than that is uh, what's his name from the, the Bears tight end? Uh, oh, oh, uh, um, Zach Miller. Zach Miller. That right. one was brutal. I, I was watching that at Gary's house and. He went upstairs, I think, to get his son something to eat or something. He went upstairs, and it happened. And I remember he caught the touchdown pass, and they they overruled the touchdown and the injury. And One of like, the worst calls ever. It was it was just a bad bad all around on that. And Gary came back and said, "What did I miss?" And I'm like, dry heaving. Like, <laughs> Don't watch that. <laughs> I thought you could be Bill's fan puking all over Gary's couch. Uh, I, I was, it was, there was no puke to be had. It was, but it was, it, my body was trying. It was like, there's nothing down there, but it was trying to eject it anyway. Ew. Ew. <laughs> it was, that injury was so Ew. Cool. It was like, it's like, oh, it was bad. I can't, I can't. And that watch doctor injuries. saved his life. I know. Uh, well, what is it? Um, the offensive lineman for the Raiders, like that dude almost died because of, they gave him an IV before a game and got, uh, air bubbles in his IV. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> but Alex Smith, like they, they almost lost a leg. Like yeah. That, that dude is playing in the NFL and he almost lost his leg. Ugh, Gee, that I mean that was just nauseating. <laughs> uh, is there anything else you want to talk about? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. I just want to. I, I I just want to say it's the holiday season. So if you're looking for a good gift for mom, dad, or your friends, look no further than the Marty Havlat crock pot. <laughs> <laughs> you're, just, you're just scooping chili out of it. <laughs> he puts a <laughs> chili in. <laughs> Patent pending. Oh, brother. Uh, Mom, you want to make some holiday chili in the Martin Havlat? <laughs> You're having your you're having your family over. It's like chat from weird science sounds. <laughs> I will never like think of Marty Havlat the same again now. It's like some in the face, the his face on there looks like the job of the hut smile because it's just like <laughs> spitting the chili out. <laughs> it's, it's dribbling au jus out the side oh that is so not appetizing <laughs> uh, that's how, that's how you pour the au jus out it's a, you, you scoop up the beef and then you tip it over and blah, the au jus 
Ew. <laughs> Ew. Uh, and it looks like it looks like spittoon tobacco. Oh, Marty Havlat. I wonder, I wonder what he does now. <laughs> Making crockpots. Uh, he's like, it's like a George Foreman grills. He's on a late night infomercials. <laughs> yeah, they only show him on like government uh, funded television. Oh my God, I'm selling his crockpot. Oh. <laughs> uh. Well, I think that's going to do it for this episode of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. I want to thank everybody so much for listening. Please hit subscribe however you listen to podcasts, whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, TuneIn app, Google Play, Spotify, etc. cetera. Uh, share this podcast with your friends. That's how we grow the show. Um, follow us on social media at Swirsky Sports, Facebook.com slash Swirsky Sports, Swirsky Sports.com. Again, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, bear down. We thank Dick uh, and God for all they have provided. Oh, oh, Cubs win! Cubs win! Cubs win! Oh, I don't want her. You can have her. She's a Packer fan. She can't fit in my van. And she looks like... Remember, New Yorkers, smoking crack is not legal on the plains. Bears, 31 to negative 7. The Bears! Oh, when the bears go bearing down